Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the show, a conversation about capitalism and white supremacy with two brilliant minds, Dr. Cornell West and Professor Rick Wolf. And later we hear about one small business that's operating under a different economic paradigm. All that and a few words from me on who's on the hook for the Deepwater Horizon spill. It's all coming up. Welcome to our program. The great liberation of the middle class, that's what Karl Marx called the U.S. War of Independence. Getting out from under feudalism was nice, but Marx looked to the war against slavery to empower America's workers. It didn't, as it turned out, largely he believed, because the newly emerging capitalist system was never designed to deliver the longed-for liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. In fact, quite the opposite. That's why many are giving Karl Marx's work a new look in these troubled times. Among them, our next guests. Professor Richard Wolff teaches economics at the New School University and hosts the Economic Update program on Pacifica radio stations. Professor Cornell West is the author of Race Matters, Democracy Matters, and more, and the co-host of Smiley and West on Public Radio. Welcome you both to the program. I'm so glad to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me start with the basics, you two. Thank you so much. You've been revisiting old masters. I know because we did a panel together about Tom Paine. Mm. Uh, you're doing another panel with Gail Dines and Chris Hedges. Cornell can't make it, but you're talking about Marx. Um, why? Why are you visiting these folks? Professor Wolf, Rick? I think the biggest plug for it now is that global capitalism is in terrible shape. It uh, imploded on itself in 2008, and it hasn't emerged from this crisis, not even by a little all the talk about recovery notwithstanding. The mass of people are in very bad shape economically. The gap between most people on the one hand and a tiny number of very wealthy people on the other is becoming a kind of daily obscenity in everyone's face. And so people are naturally asking, is this the best we can do? And discovering that there's a whole tradition out there called Marxian theory, which says, no, we can do better and that we have to question a system that works this way, and so they rediscover Marx. But Marx was a German <clears throat> writing about industrialism in 19th century Northern Europe. Is that relevant to people here in the States in the 21st century, oh, especially African American I people? I think it's it? very relevant. Karl Marx was one of the great prophetic figures of the 19th century because he had an analysis of capitalism that kept track of the precious humanity of working people and poor people. No one can deny under global capitalism that there's been an escalation of oligarchs or plutocrats. No one can deny that big banks and big corporations do not dominate government. Mm -hmm. No one can deny that working people are not benefiting to the degree to which hedge fund folk are, Wall Street people are, so that wealth inequality and all that goes with it has to be, one has to come to terms with it. So in that sense, Marxist analysis is probably the most indispensable form of analysis to make sense of a highly financialized monopoly capitalism in our day. What did he write about the U.S.? Did he write much? Oh yeah, he made his living, such as it was, working as a reporter for a newspaper here in the United States for many of his years. It was through that that he covered the Civil, Civil War, War in the United States right. and the whole interest of slavery that was very important. He wrote it voluminously about all of that. No, this was a man who basically understood that the promise of capitalism, which he always likened to the French Revolution. Uh, Laura, you put it very nicely at the beginning. The slogans of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, brotherhood, these were the promise of a capitalism that would replace feudalism and bring us, finally, a society that was free and equal and had all those qualities. And by the time he's a young man, he realizes that was a false promise. Mm -hmm. Capitalism had indeed replaced feudalism, but it wasn't bringing us liberty, equality, and fraternity. And then he made that great breakthrough, and he taught us capitalism is not the agent for liberty, equality, fraternity. It's the biggest obstacle we face to arrive at that. And that was the impetus for the work that he then did to analyze how and why capitalism operated as such an obstacle. Well, but how does that work out? In, in this <clears throat> country, we're, we're given the idea that communism, socialism is about control, capitalism is about freedom. And freedom resonates, resonated with, with centuries of people in this country, at least two. 
Well, I think, you know, freedom, like everything else, like beauty and so on, lies a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Uh, freedom to do what? Mm -hmm. Marx was very clever. I said, yes, you can free a person from slavery, but what freedom is that if the next thing they are is enslaved to another system that treats them very similarly? Marx loved to use the phrase wage slave because he wanted to teach working people that when you move from slave or peasant status and you're now a wage earner, that may turn out to be another kind of slavery leading you to have to recognize that the further break has to be made and then Marx tells us how and why that's the case. But that's a tricky sell in the U.S., or at least it must have been in Marx's time, um, Cornell, because freedom from slavery was a big plus, and to be a wage slave rather than someone getting paid nothing at all was certainly a positive. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. I think Marx was also preoccupied with what's missing in the f slogans of the French Revolution which is democracy. See, Marx is part of a radical democratic tradition that says that the voices of those and in institutions must shape the direction of those institutions. Mm -hmm. So wage slavery is another form of undemocratic governance to the degree to which workers' voices, and of course Brother Wolf talks about this with unbelievable eloquence and, and insight in his recent works, that the voices of workers are not heard. And so it, America talks about its love of democracy, but when it comes to the workplace, our workplace looks very crypto-feudalistic <laughs> in terms of those at the top dictating and, and shaping the destiny of those units. But I mean, Brother Wolf lays this out. You want to well. come in on that? Sure. I mean, it, it, Cornell says it very nicely and summarizes it. When you go to work in the morning in a capitalist system, you're walking into a place where what you do how you do it, what's done with the fruits of your brain and your muscle, are all handled by a tiny group of people over whom you exercise no power at all. They can fire you and do when they think it's in their interest to do so. This is the opposite of democracy. In a democratic workplace, you would say every person, every man and woman who is part of this participates in making the decision since they all have to live with the results. That's the democratic idea. And the modern capitalist enterprise is the negation of democracy. That's why it's always been so bizarre to imagine a system so fundamentally undemocratic in its workplaces should present itself as the agent or the, the bringer of democracy around the world. Mm -hmm. Talk about our relation to the world in all of this. Is, is everywhere seeing a kind of revival of interest in Marx in the same way that we're seeing it in this country? I wouldn't say it's in the same way, but you're seeing revivals of people inspired by Marx, even people who don't know that they're inspired by Marx, <laughs> because Marx's influence is so direct. Let's remember, you know, Marx is a, a, an exile from Germany, lives in England, writes in the middle of the 19th century, and by now Marxism is a reality in every country on the face of this planet. That's an astonishing spread. It, it is, in a sense, everywhere. and so. It's rediscovered periodically because it's repressed periodically. So we, we kind of have that struggle back and forth. But just to pick three examples, in Alberta, Canada, there's an election which brings to, to power for the first time people who have been influenced by Marx. Mm -hmm. in, in Greece, we have a whole new shift of a society led by people who are self-defined as Marxists. And now in Spain as well, a radical alteration. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see everywhere that a capitalism that can, can function as unfairly, unjustly, and unequally as this one is producing, as Marx, by the way, suggested it might, mm -hmm. its own critics and its own grave diggers by the very way it operates. Now, Cornell, you've been in the mm -hmm. civil rights movement a long time. Go back to the 60s, the 50s. There was more Marx, if you like, in the civil rights movement of those days than there is today. Fair enough? Oh, absolutely. I what mean, I, I, I come from people, black people, who are very way of engaging in collective expression. Jazz is democratic, symbolic action. Every voice is lifted in the orchestra. There's not one monolithic, patriarchal figure. Count, you might call it the Duke Ellington Band, but his voice is one voice against Johnny Hodges and the others. Every voice must be heard mm -hmm. in the collective performance. Same is true in the workplace for Marx. 
but also, and this is, I would add even with Marx, because I was blessed to write a book, The Ethical Dimensions of Marxist Thought, over 30 years ago, is democracy on the one hand, but it's individuality on the other. Marx so, comes out of Schiller, he comes out of German Romanticism. He's concerned about the precious humanity of every individual, including working people's individuality. So individuality and democracy go hand in hand, just like in Count Basie's band. Individuality and democracy go hand in hand. So there was deep overlap. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. ended up a democratic socialist. And in the black tradition, going back to Reconstruction, you had that interesting flowering of individualism, people f out from under slavery, running for office and building new towns, but also this incredible co-investment, co investment in each other. Um, cooperatively owned farms, public property, education, all the rest of it. and so forth. But again, I draw a distinction between individuality and individualism. Mm. Because see, individualism tilts in the capitalist direction. Individuality, radical democratic levelers, Marx. I was part of a conversation not so long ago on the web, organized by, uh, among others, our friend Garel Peravitz. Um, Oh, and yeah. the issue was raised by Angela Glover Blackwell of PolicyLink mm -hmm. that you could have a new economic system as we've had new different systems in the past that fail to be inclusive and that are taken apart in effect um, through their lack of inclusivity. Going back to the 30s, why, why were um, farm sure. workers and domestic workers cut out of Fair Labor Standards Act laws and so on and so forth? What are we doing now to make sure that doesn't happen again in this discussion about a new economy, Rick? I think it's, it's the notion of inclusion is crucial in, in all of this. That is, when I, for example, talk a lot about workers cooperating, redesigning the very basic institutions that produce the goods and services we all depend on, inclusion is the central motif. It's a democratic process of including every single person so that when you go to work, you are not going as a drone. You're not going to be told what to do, how to do, where to do it, when to do it. You're going into an institution, the workplace, where you are as much a controller as a controlled, where you share all of the functions with everybody else. That's a radical new way to describe the workplace, which for most adults is the single most important expenditure mm -hmm. of their time. Five days out of seven, eight hours of the day, you're in the workplace as most adults are, and therefore to make that really democratically inclusive, that's a radical transformation of any society and is why Marx is important, because he pointed us as to how and why that would be the next step beyond capitalism in a way that no one else really was able to do at that time. You talk about worker-determined enterprises. Right. There Directed are a lot of people and determined. There are a lot of people mm. that would say, you know, that the street hustle is a pretty worker-determined e enterprise. Are there models out there that uh, excite you, Cornell, that you see where people are developing these kind of ways of working together that maybe we don't call new economy, but it's out there happening? I think there's a lot of work of cooperative efforts in Spain. I mean, again, Mother Wolf talks about it in his book. And there are anarchist brothers and sisters play a very important role because they're concerned about worker cooperative too. The Proudhon and others talked about this as an overlap. I think the big difference is one of the reasons why people are afraid of Marxism is because they think of Lenin, they think of Pol Pot, they think of Mao, they think of professional revolutionaries running political parties rather than his rich analysis, his deep love of working in poor people and showing that they can live lives of decency and dignity and therefore talking about cooperatives and not always tied to professional political parties mm -hmm. that are dictating X or Y. And you Soviets without Bolsheviks, oh, that's the Kronstadt Rebellion, that's the Council Communism of Gorder and Panikok and others. That's very much tradition that we're a part of. But when you get to Mao and Lenin, that's what people think of automatically. They say, oh, well, no, you got these professionals dictating the workers what to do. No, that's authoritarian again. Mm. It's not democratic. That's like trying to transform Duke Ellington's band into a military band. It's not going to work. <laughs> You're not going to get the improvisation and the rhythm that you need. Now, of course, frontline communities, communities of color, less privileged communities are better at all of this because they have to be um, than the elites who are very happy being in that 1% that has the same amount of wealth as half the world's population or whatever it is. Does Marx have any insight on how do we flip the balance of power? Uh, well, I think, I think Marx had a cosmopolitan sensibility. He's open to 
all persons, no matter how oppressed or the less depressed, who are interested in being willing to be part of a cooperative enterprise that put working and poor people at the center. I think, you know, you and I would agree that there's still a rapacious individualism, even among poor people, among blacks and browns and reds and women and gays and lesbians and so forth. But we do have rich traditions of cooperative activity among peoples of color and, 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 and we're up against one so heck of an entrenched power elite. No? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And yet, as Marx himself explained, when the people who run the capitalist system keep running it for their own profit and the number of them becomes smaller and those of us who are watching our futures and our hopes disappear as they do it, they are in the end undercutting their own yeah. capacity to survive. I think we're at a time in the history of capitalism when we are all spectators to a self-destruction awaiting us to become no longer passive but active in making sure that the passing of capitalism leads us in a place that we will be happier as human beings to be in, and that's a heavy burden on us, but there's not much else we can do because otherwise we're going to let this system take us down with it. Last word, Cornell. That's very real. That's very real. We've got impending ecological catastrophe. We've got possible nuclear catastrophe. And we've got capitalist catastrophe tied to white supremacy, male supremacy, and all the hatreds, Jews, Arabs, Muslims, gay, lesbian. We are in a dark moment. Marx had a blue sensibility. He was keeping track of the darkness and the thickness of evil, but he knew resistance was always possible. I love that about him. And I am cheered by the fact that we are even having this conversation, and you two have it a lot. Thank you so much, both of you, for Thank coming you. in. Thank you. Thanks to for the you. opportunity. Thank you. Get more information and more on this conversation at our website. Manju Rajendran has been making waves as an organizer and activist since she was a teenager. We recently got a chance to talk with her about the ways in which her family's restaurant's been successful at modeling an anti-capitalist way of doing business. Ms. Manju. Five years ago, our family began an incredible journey to start a food justice restaurant called Vimala's Curry Blossom Cafe. And it's named after my mother, Vimala Rajendran, who has been cooking since she was seven. Um, she's an incredible, incredible cook. And, and she's an incredible cook because she cooks with love. Like she thinks of it as her ministry, as her social justice work, as her art form, her vehicle for change, and it is a huge contribution to social justice work. It began uh, after 18 years of a community kitchen that we ran out of our home, and, and even the creation of the community kitchen was kind of an inadvertent thing. So when I was, I guess, 12 or 13, um, a bunch of women from my the neighborhood that I grew up in invited my mom to come out for dinner for her birthday and they said to her um, the abuse that you're living with is unlivable like we we have to come up with a strategy to get you out of there and she said it's not feasible I I don't have my own independent immigration status and I don't have the financial means to get away and they said to her well every time we walk by your house you invite us in and you feed us. What if we were to give you a little bit of money for that exchange and you give us enough food to feed our families? And so she started cooking big amounts of food and we would um, do a little Indian food takeout out of the side door of our tiny little home and she would save cash from this and was raising her own small independent in income. And that sort of positioned her so that one day when the opportunity came to run away unexpectedly we um, we hit the road and we left um, we lived underground for a few weeks and we um, we were homeless for a time living in various people's um, whatever they could offer us to stay um, and we kept the community dinners going through this process people would put whatever they could afford in a jar and take home as much as they needed 
then after 18 years of this, a jealous uh, restaurant owner called the health department and they, they told the health department that we were doing this. They said, you've got to, you've got to bust this. <laughs> and so um, my mother called me in tears and said, the health department just called. We have to call the food back in. You know, we were going to be serving out in this place. Um, she told my brother to go and uh, bring all the food back, tell all the people to come back to the house and eat the food. So they ate it all. And the next day we kind of began strategizing uh, over the phone. I was living in Chicago at the time. And she said, if you and your brother and your sister are willing to come home and help this restaurant launch, then I'll do it. And so I said yes, and I moved home from Chicago. We had our soft opening at the time of the US Social Forum in Detroit, and we pay workers a living wage. We source most of our produce and um, meat from small local family farms. Um, we work hard to have uh, as much shared decision-making as possible. We, um, we reduce waste in, in big ways, like we're part of the pilot composting program in our area and um, compost tons and tons of what most restaurants have to throw away. We're part of a national organizing effort to try and fight for a living wage for all restaurant workers. We're serving healthy, locally sourced, affordable food in, um, in a mixed class, mixed race space that really uh, shifts the dynamics around the Southern table. That was Manju Rajendran, recorded at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. If you have a story about a business that's making change, let us know. BP's settlement for the Deepwater Horizon spill was great headline-grabbing news recently. Five Gulf Coast governors, as well as the U.S. Attorney General, took the opportunity to claim glory for the largest settlement with a single entity in American history. But who's in deep for the deep water? Beneath the headlines, it looks as if you and I might be. In case you missed it, under terms announced July 2nd, British Petroleum agreed to a record-breaking $18.7 billion to resolve claims related to the massive oil spill in the Gulf in 2010. Five states stand to gain from the payouts over the next 18 years. Louisiana will receive approximately $6.8 billion, according to Governor and GOP presidential contender Bobby Jindal. In her announcement, AG Loretta Lynch declared that ever since the spill, the Justice Department has been, quote, fully committed to holding BP accountable and to restoring the environment and the economy of the region at the expense of those responsible, not the American taxpayer. But if that's what the DOJ committed to, it's not exactly what they got. As we've mentioned before, when corporations agree to pay out compensation, they can claim a tax deduction. Restitution, unlike a criminal penalty or fine, can be written off as just another cost of doing business. Of that $18.7 billion, the Justice Department seems only to have tied $5.5 billion to criminal Clean Water Act violations. The rest will likely be tax deductible, even though a New Orleans judge ruled BP guilty of gross negligence. $18.7 billion is a hefty sum, but it's one that the public will largely be on the hook for. It seems to suggest that bad behavior can lead to just another corporate windfall. So maybe it's no wonder that five years after the Gulf of Mexico disaster, a Southern California coast was coated in crude oil this spring. If the DOJ had seized BP's assets and taken over control, now that might have sent a real message. Tell me what you think. Write to me, laura at grittv.org. And thanks. What does it take to go from a moment to a movement? Today we're dedicating the entire Laura Flanders show to a special report from Baltimore. People in Baltimore are tired of just sitting idle, waiting for change to happen, so we're going to make change happen ourselves. Whether it's through breaking the curfew, civil disobedience, or daily protests, whatever it is, we're going to do it. Today 
on The Laura Flanders Show. Andrew Coburn discusses what's wrong with the way the U.S. fights war. George Bush, let's hear it for George Bush. Um, he was actually quite restrained in his use of deployment of drone assassination because he preferred to capture people and torture them. Later in the program, we look at the story of Fahd Ghazi. Fahd Ghazi was one of the first men to arrive at Guantanamo. He was just a few months past his high school graduation.